Ben Adis, I am with In Touch. I am one of the national ambassadors. I am also the marketing director for CIA. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, so hello and welcome back. Um, it's exciting to see everyone join us again. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about In Touch and, and let you guys know a little, you know, some things that we have going on. Um, first thing that I I have or that I want to talk about is Mari's shirt. Ask me what I do. Um, we have joined with Be Try for Us. It is an organization that is wonderful. They are out of Atlanta, um, Orlando and Tampa areas. So you guys have Sarah and Sarasota, so they cover that entire that entire you know they're within Florida. Um, so we've partnered with them, um, and we're gonna be selling these networking t-shirts, ask me what I do, what is a marketer. So there's so many, we'll have a store, we'll share the link with you guys later on in the chat so that you could be able to see it. Um, and then if you guys haven't joined in touch, which I'm sure most of you are, or all of you have already done so, um, make sure that you are on the platform. The platform has so many tools for you guys. We have the vault that's now launched. Um, if you missed today's session or you you're also, as you noticed, you are being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, you can turn off your cameras. Um, but this is a session that we will put on the vault. So if you have to log off early or any of those things, or if you've missed a previous session and want to go back, um, you can do that on the vault. And um, anything else that I'm forgetting, Mani, for in touch? Yeah, so we are before, our before we get, before we're done, I just want to make sure if you haven't signed up for our getaway, um, we only have like three or four more days left before you get to sign up before we announce the winner, we randomly select the winner. So if you haven't gone into in touch and registered, please do so it's free, it's fun and there's no commitment to it. I wish I could sign up for it, but I can't. <laughs> I <know, right? laughs> do it for me guys. Um, so before we get started with today's speaker, I wanna introduce to you Donna. I know that a lot of you are familiar with Donna Chuck. Donna is with New Life and she's one of our partners for Purpose. Hi, Donna. Hey, everyone. It's so good to be here. I'm really excited. Um, I love Claire and this is gonna be just wonderful for everybody participating. So very, very proud. And New Life is loving uh, being able to um, do this. And of course, having Claire as the, the presenter today is just wonderful. So very happy. Anybody has any questions about New Life, um, you can get in touch with me. Um, or just reach out to Madi or Annalise and um, they can uh, put you in touch. I think Brandy's trying to connect, by the way, Madi. Yeah, connecting everyone, so don't worry. Um, okay. Let people come in. Thank you, Donna. Here she is. So oh, you have Brandy. two Donnas. <laughs> So we are going to go ahead and get started with today's topic. Um, I do not think our speaker needs an introduction. She is very well known by most of you. Um, and today's topic is Becoming Your Most Authentic Self, hosted by Dr. Claire Musselman. So you will see her in a few seconds. She will not disappoint. It's about authenticity, is. guys. I'm showing up for you guys as my very, very best self. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yeah, I am going to probably take the mask off though because it does hurt my eyes just a little bit. Oh, all right. Thank you guys. So today we are going to talk about becoming and then living your most authentic self because so many times at work, we start out with a mask. We don't ever really get to truly come in to the values and everything that we really, who we are at our core to be our very best selves for people. And so today I want to talk about why we do what we do and how we can make it better for each other to show up fully and wholly for generations to come so that we do not have to continue to wear our masks per se as we move forward with just the way that life is continuing to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and start screen sharing and we'll get, we'll get going. So for anyone that is on here, if you do not know me, uh, my name is Dr. Claire Musselman. I am all things glitter and sparkle, and that is kind of how I branded myself. I really do believe that we can make every day better for each other. I love things being bright and beautiful, and just I like making sure that people feel that after we've had an interaction, that your life is better than it was before we met. And I really believe that we can all do that with, for one another. I think it's also important that I love this Maya Angelou quote. Because as we talk about, you know, becoming that authentic self and taking everything that you've got with you to keep moving forward in life is doing it with compassion, 
adding in some humor because life is so serious as it is, as we've learned, especially over these past two years, and then creating your own style with it, which I think it's great. I love being a part of the InTouch Masterclass series because when we look at style, I know Mari and Donna and Annalise, like that is what it's always been like, where do you come to the table from your style? And then what do you do to help enhance it in, in others? So I'm dressed as a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle because Raphael is who I used to identify with growing up so very much in my parents' basement in the 1980s when, you know, the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came out. I used to try and teach myself how to do backflips uh, on my parents' uh, garage or basement floor. If you guys remember back in the 80s, if you were old enough to have grown up in that time period in any capacity, uh, basements were like concrete with just like a nice layer of carpet, wasn't a lot of padding. And so after a couple of tries, I learned it was very important to be able to do a backflip correctly, or you could really injure yourself. And it worked out well as I ended up becoming a cheerleader. And I, I we had to do backflips then as well. And I still relate that to my days of my Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle uh, lifestyle. So, but when I think of it, I want you guys to think about this and feel free to put it in the chat. I want to know who you identify with. So there's four Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You've got Raphael, Donatello, Michelangelo, and well, I'm forgetting the blue one, Leonardo. So I want you to put who you most identified with in the chat. And if you have not seen Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and this does not is not relevant for you, then I'm very sorry you have missed out on life. And now I want you to think why. Like, why do you like that one? And so when I think about Raphael, I'm putting up two pictures. And of course, when you look at the newer Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies, they're, uh, they're not as cute as they once were back in like the 1980s, but that's okay. I mean, they're all their own, their own uh, breed at this point. But what I really liked about Raphael when I was growing up is that I always found him to be fearless. I always found him to be strong. He tends to be like the super muscly meathead. Um, I thought it was just awesome. All of the turtles like pizza, and I feel like that's just like a normal food group to like and growing up. But I also like that he was aggressive, and I put the exclamation points next to that because that's not a word that you're supposed to utilize if you're a female, because it is not a word that is thought of in a, in a positive light in any capacity, but it's what I liked about him. He was somebody that in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you knew he had your back. He would always be there He'd always show up, they fight to the end. You know, there is something about that characteristic that I really liked about it. You could have also said he was a little bit angry and I probably was like that a little bit more so when I was on my younger side, but I always wanted to show up and do what was right for other people. And I think that especially with being in this work comp space, there's a lot of it that it does. It's us showing up as our very best selves to do what we can to help people through a system that's not designed to be very easy and to help people get through it. All right, but it's also kind of fun because I really like the Ninja Turtles anyway. But so when we look at like our purpose and what you're doing, so when you're showing up as your authentic self, for me, it goes back to like, what's your purpose? What does your purpose stand for? Like your higher purpose. And then how does everything fall in line after that? So for me, I want to spend the rest of my life making other people's lives feel less broken because a lot of my childhood and early, early life didn't feel safe. I think it's probably the best way to articulate that, which is why I come to you in a costume today to show you that being your authentic self is about pulling all those layers off. So you can be your most, your most authentic version of you. So I have a daughter. I have, I have, she's going to be 13 here before I know it. And one of the things that I really strive to her is all I want you to do in life is to be happy. As long as your purpose and your mission in life all stem around happiness for yourself and other people, then you're gonna be doing what is best now for you and what's best as you continue on in your life. So when I look in this and the in the workers' compensation system, like we are trying to help restore the livelihood of people and make them feel less broken through this process, whether you're on the medical side, whether you're on the broker side, whether you are an adjuster, it doesn't matter what position you play or what role is yours while you're in this space, but it's really about making people's lives feel more whole as a result of a tragedy. And I look at this a lot and I think that the whole like feeling less broken thing is that, you know, I've been through the foster system, I've been the adoption, I've been through the adoption stuff. I know what it's like to not feel whole because you can't figure out where you belong. And it's one of those situations where the work comp system is so much like that because 
where does this injured worker fit in the system? Sometimes they feel that their employer is upset with them when really that might not be the case, but it's a breakdown in communication. So what do we do from whatever seat you sit in in the workers' compensation space to make sure that people feel that they do belong and we've got your back and we're here to make you feel safe so that you can feel like your very best version of yourself as you move forward through the recovery process. So again, all stemming back to like a bigger purpose and a bigger mission statement. So think, and if you don't have a piece of paper handy, I'm going to ask you to get one by the end of this because we're going to do an exercise at the very end that you're going to want to be able to write. So think about this. Like, what does your mission statement say? And what is your purpose for yourself? Um, so going into the workers' compensation system. So when I say I brand myself as glitter and sparkles in the industry, because this is the picture of the industry. It's been this way for 100 plus years, and we just need to do something to revitalize it. So started tagging myself as glitter and sparkles because we could have done anything to this photo to make it seem a little bit more bright and cheery and less the just less black and white and gray and dreary and hard to understand. Now, of course, the history behind the picture is actually not that at all, but this is what people think of, or they think that it's an outdated system, or they think that there's all this paper and it's not a fun place to work in, but we're all here and I have a great time every day. I show up to work. I mean, I get to wear a Ninja Turtle costume today. So it's how, how do we, per, how do you then take your purpose and mission and visualize it? Because I think of this picture every day at work and what can I do to make sure that people don't see either my team or my organization or anybody that I get to interact with within social organizations or philanthropy, anything like that, so that we don't end up in a society that feels like this is what life is. So I ask you now to take a type, to try and find a visualization that will work for you, whether it be a photo, whether it be something you can do like a vision board or something that you can see that's going to remind you about why your authenticity is going to be so important as we move forward in life. So when we, when we define authenticity, does anyone want to give me, anyone want to give me their definition of authenticity? Donna, I can see you. So I'm going to ask you first and I know you'll speak up. <laughs> what does authenticity look like to you? Authenticity is, um, I believe it is something that is deep within inside of you. That is natural, forthcoming, um, free, it's part of your spirit, part of your soul, part of your heart, but it's real. And it's when you have authenticity, you are feeling comfortable in whatever environment you're in and with ever, whoever you're with, um, no matter the circumstance. So authenticity is, um, it's just real, it's a feeling. So that's, that's my interpretation. I like that, thank you. Tandeka. I'm just going to ask like three or four of you guys, and then we'll move on. So I think authenticity is just who you are at the end of the day, you know, when, or when you wake up in the morning, just that first person that you are, who you are. And um, we hear a lot about bringing your authentic self. So I think that means just bringing that person, that belief system, your values into different spaces that you walk into without um, compromising or changing them depending on the environment that you're in. So you don't have to put your mask back on so you can go to work? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Andrea, what about you? Oh, Andrea, you're on mute, unless you're purposely on mute. Well, I was because I wasn't planning on you calling on me, although I should have known that you were going to. Um, pretty much along the lines of what Tina Decker said, you know, being able to be who you are, no matter who you're interacting with or your, your surroundings, your community, you know, just being yourself and true to who you are. I mean, you know, if you're quirky, funny, aggressive, um, passionate, you, know, the A -word. <laughs> Bad word, you should, but you should, but you should be able to be that no matter where you are. Thank you. I like that. So when, when we talk about just design or uh, defining authenticity, I think it's important that you get to show up as your very best version of you. And that's going to look completely different to every single person on this screen or that's here today. 
And what makes it beautiful is that we all need human connection. And those human connection pieces are amplified when we're able to find likeness and similarities that we might not have with other people. Now, for example, like Katie Hensley, you're right in my eye shot. So you and I have younger children. So that's a human connection piece of us. But if I never want people to think of me as a mom in the workspace, we may never be able to bond about what lovely children are all days, every day, forever. But there is those, there's those human connection points that you can empathize with other people and see like, if we're having a tough day, I see you, I hear you, you matter. I get it. And it's just those little tiny connection pieces. But if you are not in a psychologically safe space where that's appropriate for you to actually show up, like I've worked in a company before where we didn't talk about being parents. Like that's not okay because that was a sign of weakness if I would ever have to leave work early to go be a mom. That is part of my unique nature of who I am and what I want to do and how I want to achieve for the future. So when we have those type of organizational environments, that don't provide a culture to thrive with whatever that landscape might look like, that's where we end up finding a hindrance of connectivity and connection. And so I say that, so when we look at defining authenticity, the next word that I have for you is transparency. Because while we don't need to know everything, and I say these words with a caveat, when I say bringing your authentic self to work, I mean it in a very anti-harassment, anti-discriminatory term, because had someone say that to me before, they're like, well, what if you have these characteristics? Okay, be realistic in this situation. We're talking about letting people come to work as their authentic human selves, as you know, whatever the characteristics that you would describe yourself are. Again, I'm very glittery and sparkly. I also have a sleeve tattoo that I don't really want to hide because that's who I am. I like the art. I like people being able to come ask me questions about it. It gives pieces of human connectivity and it allows for stories to go with that. I get to work for an employer that could care less about it. And I am so thankful and grateful that we allow people to show up as their very best versions of themselves, where previously, let's go back to the 1980s, since that's the time period I'm kind of in, that would have never been okay. We would have always had to stay covered up. You would have always had to stay masked and you get put into this box. And what I think that we're going to see is we continue to see organizational culture be such a forward focusing thing. The younger generations want to be themselves. And if we aren't going to allow them to do that, they're not going to work for us. They've made it very, very clear that again, within parameters, of course, but everybody wants to just feel like they can be themselves with whatever that is to come in as their transparent self. And I say that that comes with a little bit of vulnerability. The very best leaders I have worked for have showcased periods of their life that things haven't always been perfect. We also, you know, live in the Instagram society where everything is awesome. Everything is perfect all the time. When you can acknowledge to a point where I'm not okay today, like, no, this stuff is very challenging right now. And be able to, again, relate those human elements of connectivity. That's where the real power is. Because when you are able to connect in those two little vulnerable moments from one person to another, it establishes trust. You get to now be like, I'm sharing this moment of my life with you so that you don't feel, I guess, as bad. We can, so you can feel more whole. But in turn, that's going to create a bond for us so that when we move forward in life, we are being able to understand like, oh, I remember when. Like, you, okay, I got you. And there's those moments that allow empathy to kind of come and take that place to help restore those human connective bonds that can weather the storm through stressful situations for those crucial conversations and some things that are a lot harder to deal with. They're also the very best moments when you wanna celebrate wins because you've got your people. And so that's where when we look at authenticity, that human connection component is where that authenticity piece comes. And the more we can live in our very best versions of ourselves and show up as who we are, the better the organizational culture is going to feel from a psychological safety standpoint, because we're all getting to be the very best versions of us. It adds value too. It shows to you the people within your teams and your organizations, I see you, I hear you, you matter. And that's a value add. Shonda Rhimes says this, and I love this. This is on my mirror right now because I tend to have affirmations in my room at, at all times. But right now is own who you are and what you've done. So that's the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so I think that as we continue to go through this conversation, we're going to talk about mentorship here in a few minutes. 
it is owning who you are. I have made some mistakes in life. You can probably Google and find them. I'm lucky enough that we didn't have Facebook around when I was in college. So lucking out on some of those situations where, you know, if I could tell my younger self what, but I can own that. And I can own the situations that I've made because I don't want other people to live the same narrative that I already did. So if I can help somebody by owning some of the mistakes that I've made and say to like Jessica Smock, hey, Jessica, I've done that before. Here was the outcome. This is what happened to me as a result of it. So I hope that you do not take that path because what I've learned in this, and this is fascinating to me through a lot of my doctoral research was a lot of the C-suite executives didn't want to mentor people because they didn't have time or they didn't really care what happened to their organization. It was very interesting. Like they had their pie, so they were gonna move on and just kind of didn't matter what happened next. If we're going to have a society and an organizations that thrive, we've got to do a good job of sharing our failures so people don't repeat what we've already done. I would rather have people like Jessica go fail in a different way so that you can go be innovative and try something that we haven't done before. But the only way that we can do that, whether it be through speaking or trying new technology or trying to bring teams along or change management, there's a plethora of things you could think about in this capacity, but owning the mistakes that we made along the way, or hey, here's what happened when we tried it at this point of time, in this manner, at this, at this juncture. Here's what I would suggest you do. You try it differently. I think maybe it could make a better chance now. Or, hey, we tried to execute change way too quickly and it failed. And everybody left and people were really upset. But if we are able to share these stories when life's not perfect, it helps. It allows a space for other people to try and create an innovative way to move forward that we haven't already done. But again, it's owning the mistakes that you've made and then being willing enough to share them with others so they don't do the same thing. And owning what you've done. One of the things that I think is very interesting is that we, we as humans sometimes have a hard time being like, oh yes, I did that. Like I did that. Like I'm still getting used to being like, oh, Dr. Claire. Oh yeah, yeah, I did that. Okay, cool. But if you're able to own your successes, it allows other people to own theirs. And that's something that I think has a lot of power because what we do and how we show up there's a lot of other people that see us. And I always think of my daughter in this capacity where if I can show up, she's going to kill me today when I have to go pick her up from church camp, but I'm totally showing up like this. She's going to be like, mom, be like, I don't care. I get to be the embarrassing parent today. And I wore a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle costume to work, but it's okay because then she's like, eh, that's my mom. All right. Okay. We can do fun stuff in life. But for the people, the other people that get to see you just owning it, there's some power to that because it allows creativity in other people to thrive as well. I consider it like nurturing soil because it gives you a great place to grow and allows others to thrive next to you because flowers don't compete, go, don't compete next to each other when they're blooming, they just simply bloom. So everyone can have a piece, of, can sit at the table and be beautiful and bloom in whatever way possible. But it's up to us when you're coming as your most authentic self to be able to set the stage for that so that you can really enhance other people's lives by allowing that to be your authenticity that you bring to the table. So when we talk about owning failures, that's something I think is just super imperative. There's just, I mean, I couldn't list all of them in this hour, but I've learned from them. And then when we talk about them and we can grow, it isn't always about being perfect. And I am a chronic overachiever. So that perfection is always there in the back of my mind. But the more that I'm able to own my failures, it gives this amplitude for other people to do the same. And to talk about like, you know, I've had leadership pitfalls where I have pushed organizational change way too fast. You can be met with resistance. So when people are trying to do and push new vision and push new ways through, it's great to be able to have your board of directors is what I like to call them, are people that are going to be there to listen to you. And they're not here to hurt your feelings, but they're here to help guide you. But we've got to look at that from like yourself. What do you need to get to where you want to go? So that all ties back to your purpose. Like, what do you want your purpose and your mission? And where do you want to go? All of this stuff ties right back into what does that look like for you being your authentic self? And one of the greatest powers, I think, in owning my failures are, I understand that I am not necessarily received well by everyone. So I picked a mentor two years ago that I knew didn't like me. Like, I know I'm a lot, I'm glittery, I'm coming into a boardroom with my tattoos out and I have a pretty big personality that I've learned to just own because that's okay, because that's me. 
And so I knew he wasn't really that keen. So I was like, why don't you mentor me? I would love you to give me your pers- perception of me so that I can learn how to taper and navigate what I need to do in a boardroom setting so that we're all moving collectively towards the greater good. And so I, where can I push? Where can I challenge the status quo? And what can I continue to show up as, as my authentic self, but also the, so that we can change the status quo? so that it continues to let people show up as them, even though I might be the only one in, around a table of 12. So it's things like that that I think that are really helpful when you're looking for people that can help be part of your community and your team to help you thrive. When we talk about balance, balance is always a good one. So the work-life balance. So I continue to think that as long as life is aligned with your purpose and your mission and your values, if everything falls into place, that's what I consider balance. Now, some other people might say, oh no, work-life balance is I work eight to five and then I'm with my family. That's not my jam and I'm okay with that. But I think we also have to look at it from different perspectives where people are gonna value different things at different points of their lives. I have the opportunity to educate younger children or younger college students when they are coming in to do public speaking with me. And one of the things that I love to hear is what is important to them right now. Like, are you looking to just get out of college and graduate and go do sales? Do you just need to learn how to interview in front of somebody? What do you want your life to look like? And they have such different values, even at that age, that it's important to recognize what a balance would look like for them, as well as with anyone within your organization. You know, sometimes people are going to have kids when they're 25. Sometimes they're going to wait until they're 40. So what the work-life balance is very, it's a very interesting dynamic. Some people might not have kids at all. Some people might want to be workaholics their whole life. Whatever that looks like for you, we've got to learn that whatever your balance is that continues to make you feel whole is okay. So for me, I get asked a lot. People say, you do a lot. Yeah, I do. But it's all in alignment with my purpose, my mission, and my values. I also have a really big support system and tribe that not everybody gets to see. I have a really great relationship with my ex-husband. And so that's how I, we both get to ebb and flow and live careers that we love because we just come together and make it work for our kiddo. So from that work-life balance standpoint, there's a lot of things that people don't see that make it so that I feel whole with whatever I'm doing, even though it might not be something that works for you. And so that's where I really caution with the whole work-life balance stuff. Now, I will tell you, if I ever try to step out of anything that's in my purpose, mission, vision, values, alignment, it's a lot harder to get it done. It's way harder to get it done, but that's because it's not in alignment with where I want my life to go. So think about that too. Again, tying that back up to what is your purpose? What do you want to accomplish with your life and what do you want it to be? And then your balance will figure it out. I can tell you right now, I need to balance a little bit more into the gym and on the exercise equipment, but you know, we'll get there because it's called balance. (laughs) And then overall happiness. Our purpose in life really should be to be happy because when you're happy, it makes it a lot easier for people to be happy around you. There's a lot of context that people, you know, we've got the fake happy, but in the real happy, but only you know what makes you feel good. And so whenever I feel that I'm not going to be able, like I'm not showing up as like my happy, chipper, awesome self, I go back to the basics. I go back to meditation first thing in the morning. I go back to doing practicing gratitude, being very thankful for the things that I have. I create space to simply think and breathe and be in an environment that just allows me a little bit of clarity to figure out how to get back into the focus of me feeling joy. I practice savoring. I try to savor a moment every day and just focus on whether it be drinking a latte, whether it be petting my dog, whether it be actually getting some snuggle time, if I can actually get close enough to my child that she's not pushing me away. You know, there's just a lot of little moments, but those moments when you focus on practicing your five senses throughout that time period really amplifies the happiness factor. Exercising at least 30 minutes a day, another easy one. Exercise increases endorphins. Endorphins are, make people happy. Um, Elle Woods from uh, Legally Blonde on that one. But there's a lot of things about going back to the basics to figure out what's your foundation because we, can, we are in charge of our own happiness. It has nothing to do with anyone else. So what does your own happiness look like and how can you show up into the mirror and look at yourself and hold yourself accountable for what areas do I feel deficient in right now? And then what's my plan to move it forward? So just things, 
things like that. And then how do you define your own energy? Like what gives you energy? I can tell you very transparently, and I know I've got at least a couple of coworkers on here. We've been together for the past week at a leadership retreat. And that is me being on a lot. This weekend, my friends want to get together and I do not want to be with them because I need to recharge my own energy. And it took me until I was about 35 years old to figure out that's okay. If I want to go be out there and be on and be filling the people on my leadership team and be filling my team and my organization and trying to bring my very best self every single day and then still come home and be mom, there are going to be things that I have to balance out then. Like I don't want to go be social all weekend when I just need some time to rest and recharge. So I cautious us when we are trying to be our authentic selves that I'm not going to show up as my very best authentic self this weekend if I force myself when I already am feeling a little bit low on the energy spectrum. So pay attention to your energy. With that, who are you hanging out with and how do you surround yourself? How do you surround yourself with people? So again, going back not only to that board of directors, but who are the people that you talk to on a regular basis? How do they make you feel when you're done talking to them? And this can be a very, very tricky component because sometimes your friends, you've been friends with them forever but you might feel completely defeated or depleted or exhausted after you talk to them. So what is that doing for you to get you into your very best, authentic, happy self? And what does that look like moving forward? I've got friends that I know if I'm going to see them, I've got to be very careful from like a time commitment because I know it's going to end up taking a little bit more energy than I want to. And so I'm telling you to start paying attention to the balance of where does your energy come from? Where do you get it? When you leave conversations with people, do you feel that you've moved the needle forward or do you feel that you're tired now and you need to go home and nap? There's just things like that that you've got to start paying attention to so you can keep functioning on these cylinders that make you happy and authentically beautiful with who you are in your soul. Energy is probably one of the craziest ones. Let me talk about leaders and leadership. Let's go into this whole leadership conundrum because I think it's kind of interesting. So there are leaders and then there is leadership. There are lots and lots of leaders in the world. There's not a lot of leadership. So when we look at how people show up and you look at how people use verbiage, how do people use tone? How do people show passion, purpose? How do they make their teams feel valued? Those are the things that if, as you're trying to, I don't know, fine tune what you want to show up as for your very best authentic self, start paying attention to that. And then if you have things that you see in other people, what are those characteristics that you admire? So if you've got your paper handy, think of one person, one leader that you admire because of their leadership, not because of their positional power, but think of someone you admire. It doesn't have to be a formalized leader position. Like I love Shonda Rhimes. Not that I would call her like a leader in my life, but I do. I like that she took a year and said yes to a lot of things that made her feel uncomfortable. So there's aspects of her life that I'm always like, yes, I like that. Or that she left ABC when she didn't feel like they were created, that she didn't feel valued anymore. There are very specific things that I think of when I admire Chandra Rhimes, that those are the components that I still want to make sure that I add into my life. Like if I'm not feeling valued, did I go ask for it? What did I do to try and change it on my own? And then sometimes you have to know when to walk away. Those I think are very interesting attributes that she possesses that I admire very much so. And I like that she just talks about how you have to be in charge of where you are gonna go to get yourself moving forward. So let's hear from, who do you admire? Lisa Rice, give me someone you admire. Not to put you on the spot, but actually you. Oh. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, when I first met you, I knew we were going to be great friends and just seeing all the stuff that you do and pushing our industry to, you know, in a positive atmosphere. It's just, to me, it's amazing. And you, you're always happy and energetic and the little things that you do, you don't realize how important it makes that person feel. Oh, thank you very much. I did not ask her to say that. I just want to <laughs> say that. All right, Stacey Piazza, I have not seen you in forever. Tell me, who do you admire and why? Oh. I can't hear you, Stace, but you're not on mute. All right, well, I'm gonna go down one while Stacey fixes her stuff. Kendrin. 
Who do you admire? But you're super excited that you met me last month. <laughs> <laughs> the first person that uh, came to my mind was my mom. Uh, she's the type of person that will always put other people first. She has the busiest lifestyle. She has five kids. She gives time to each and every one of us, but also just other people, even random strangers. She's the type of person, like you're at a supermarket and my whole life as a kid, like I would see this and now I'm, I understand why, but like I, random people would come up to her and just open up. Like, you know, we're down the vegetable aisle. This lady would just come up and just start talking to her. And I was like, mom, can we go? Can we go? And she would just stand there for 20 minutes and, you know, talk to people and just listen to them and um, just always being there for other people. And, you know, I think that in life, we all could, you know, be better at that and um, just being a good person and taking time for people, even complete strangers, because you can change someone's life by a 20 minute conversation. And just, she was definitely, you know, my inspiration and still is. And yeah, she was the first person that came to my head. <laughs> I like that. I like what you just said about, especially like changing, changing somebody's life just after a conversation. I was having a less than desirable day a couple of days ago and literally some random stranger just walked by and smiled. And when mm -hmm. I tell you guys, most smiles are started by another smile. It is not a joke because then I smiled. And then the next person that walked by smiled and you start this ripple effect. And it is so awesome. And even under masks, it's been in a lot of airports lately, you can tell when people are smiling. Like there's a big difference, especially when you're on a phone call, you can hear it in people's tone. So I really like that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let's do one more. Yashika, who, who do you admire and why? I have a really good friend. Her name is Shanisa Harrington and um, she's amazing. She's such an empowering leader. So I love wow. that she always empowers her team and um, she doesn't take the credit. Like she was, I was just talking to her the other day and she was telling me she was doing a report for work. And normally when the report is done, the person who turns it in, the manager turns it in and they think, oh, the manager's done all this great work. But when she turned in her report, she highlighted how her team contributed to the completion of the report and she educated her team on why things that they were doing all along were important to what she was doing and so I, I just love the fact that she empowers and she educates and I think as a leader um, you can't have better attributes than doing that. I like that that was really great. Stacey Thanks. did you get yours to work because I don't want to skip over you but I did want to give you an opportunity. <laughs> No, because now you muted for, through Zoom. She, she put her answer in the chat. She said Taylor okay. Swift. Okay. There you go. Are you talking, Stacy? No, that, but she said Taylor Swift. She seems very authentic and real, and I can okay. listen to her music with my kids. Awesome. I like that. All right. I don't want to leave out the guys in the room. Nicholas Duncan, who do you admire? Why? Give me a characteristic about that person that you admire. Well, um, uh, there are a lot of people who have kind of influenced, um, but somebody that I have grown to admire are a couple different people. One for me has been RuPaul, has been kind of a, a role model, you know, um, as, uh, as a queer man myself, to be able to kind of see somebody be just who they are authentically at all times and be real has always been very encouraging to me. And then most recently, a new friendship that I developed um, uh, kind of also gave me a different direction and focus. Um, of course, you know that I'm going to say you, Claire. Um, I, you know, you've always been that. I've always been a rhinestone and glitter kind of person myself. And uh, I've always been the shiniest thing in the room, regardless of what the room was. And so I appreciated being able to meet somebody who had a very much similar style, who had a very much similar kind of personalities, the kind of things that are always want to be able to be shiny and beautiful in the room. And that's always very me. And that shoe closet that you have made me weep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate that so very much. It's Cause that's where I feel like you never know what difference you're making in people's life at all. So thank you guys for that. Um, so if you have not ever done that exercise where you think about people that you admire 
drill down. Like, why do you admire them? So I asked, does she go, okay, she empowers. How does she empower? And she says, you know, she gives her team the credit where the credit is due and highlights that. You know what, Yashika, I'm going to take that back for my next one-on-one -on -one with my boss. I'm going to make sure that I highlight all of my leaders that are busting their buns to make sure that they get the good recognition for that. So thank you. I will be taking that away as well because we learn really well from one another. And so that's where it's like, why? What is the why that you like this person? What is it about their captivation? Like, how do they captivate a room? How do they make you feel? Why do you feel that way as a result of being around those people? And I think that it's important that we figure out, like, if these are the people that you're looking up to, what is it? And can you adapt to it? Can you find something that helps enhance your life as a result of it? Are there certain things that you can be doing daily? Because we're always, our goals are super easy to accomplish. We just have to tweak certain elements of our daily life in order to get there, which again, I'm going to go back to the gym. I mean, if I wanted to wake up early and go to the gym every day, COVID-38 wouldn't happen. You know, I mean, just certain things happen. And I have to keep joking about this because it makes me feel better about life at the moment. So, <laughs> but then also, how do you talk to yourself? That's something else. When you show up in the morning and you're getting ready, you're getting ready for your day, how do you talk to yourself? What language do you use? Like I shared with you guys that I have quotes. I put quotes up on the mirror and they're usually relevant to something that's going on either in that day, week, month, and then they serve their purpose and they move on. But I, I see them. It's a repetition thing. It's every day. It's how do you talk to yourself? Um, if anyone ever saw the TV show Being Mary Jane, she had quotes everywhere around because it was her to remind herself how to talk to herself. And so it's things like that where you, how, how do you show up as yourself? How do you talk to yourself? How do you remind yourself that it's okay? Like you gotta be human, things happen, we move forward. Then how do you build that resiliency in yourself? So, you know, I told you guys that I meditate, I do practice gratitude, I send thank you notes. I send notes to people I haven't talked to in a while because I just really want to make sure that I'm practicing gratitude to let these people know how they've influenced my life. I think those things are important. A lot of times we don't take, like we'll acknowledge that, oh yes, I had this lovely dinner with Donna, she was fantastic. I should send her a note or I should do something. And then that moment fleets away and we move on with life. Where really, if we started to capitalize on those very, very little moments in our world at that point, by the time that that note gets to Donna a week later, that could be showing up in her mailbox at the most perfect time where she's like, I didn't realize I had that impact. I don't remember actually saying that, but it can then, like Kendra was talking about with her mom, can change the trajectory of what has gone on in Donna's day, week, or month. So not only do you feel good in the process of writing it, when Donna gets to receive that, it stems something completely different, but that's an authentic moment that you felt. And it's a recognizing that and providing it a value in that moment to make cool things happen again as a result of things. So when you think about, those are just some little tidbits and things that I think about. Mentoring, if you were, I'm oh, sorry, 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 wants to chime in on this. <laughs> Mentoring, if you do not have a mentor or you don't mentor, I challenge you to do both. When you walk away and leave here today, I mean, Tandeka can put in the transitions if you need a group to help you get going. Um, but also I challenge you to find 52 people to have coffee within a year. You will learn so much from 52 cups of coffee. You could do just a half an hour once a week, find people that you wouldn't normally meet with. Cause it's great to have coffee with your friends. It's great to have people that roll in your same social circles or your same organizational culture or your same industry. Find people that you wouldn't normally go to because they're gonna teach you more about yourself from a completely different landscape than you would ever have thought possible. I do this with our college students. We lead a track here in Des Moines called Women Lead Change or it's a conference that occurs in October. And I have the pleasure of leading the student track. And so I always say, Go to the people that you want some advice from, but then I also go find somebody you would never ever think of reaching out to. Like for example, I don't have a big finance IT background. So I would go try and find somebody who's an actuary and start hanging out with them and doing my cups, my 52 cups of coffee because they think differently and they can add value to your life by helping you challenge in how your thought process is and how they see the world because this will help grow your landscape and helps you with you especially if you can show up as your authentic self, because they're going to help you see things in a completely new light. It's, it's a very fun challenge. So I would ask that. So how do you find a mentor? Again, finding people with who do you admire? Why do you admire them? Are there people that could be better suited for you? Like I told you, I found one 
because I knew that they didn't like me. <laughs> and I thought that, and I say that in a way that like I could tell our energy just didn't hit. And so I wanted a better understanding of how I was being received. And so to, or I was very transparent with that gentleman too, when I was like, I just feel like we don't jive. And he's like, we do not. We're very different than I am. It's like, perfect. Then will you mentor me? Because I would really like to understand your perspective and what I could do to help myself move forward in life. And what does that look like? So you've got to be able, be able to put yourself out there and be vulnerable in those situations. I knew that one might not end well, but it did. It was great. And now we continue to work on our mentoring and it's great. I also think you should all be mentors. Like, yeah, it's great to go get one, but you can also learn a lot about yourself by helping others. And there are so many people, it, it's not an age thing. It's not a position thing. There is so much that we can learn from each other based upon our personal experiences to help people grow, develop, bloom, and feel comfortable being who they are within whatever space that they sit in. Um, psychological safety is probably the biggest piece that I think makes us the most authentic. One of the things that I tried to do within my organizational teams is to let people show up and talk. Because sometimes there is, once you have a title or once you have a certain position within a company, people stop talking to you and they are afraid to come talk to you about things that matter because it's not necessarily a safe environment. So whatever you work in or whatever you operate in, try to create that psychological safeness so people can come and be their authentic selves. What does that feel like? How do you feel good or psychologically safe when you're with your leadership team, your organizational team, any organizations that you're a part of? What does that look like? And by you offering a little bit more of a sliver of your vulnerability into who your authentic self is might be exactly what's needed for other people to be able to do that exact same thing. Um, yes, yeah, strategic and then strategic truth. There is strategy in trying to create a psychologically safe space in utilizing small components to help drive mission, vision, values forward. But you can also help other people be able to execute that in the same way. So even if you have leaders that do not create a psychologically safe environment, because they do exist, they are still out there until all of us go out there and change the world in our Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle outfit. But what can you do to share some of your truth, like I just said, with little vulnerability slivers that keep you true to your purpose and your mission in life, but also can help somebody else who might not be at that point yet? And how do you bring them to the table with you? And if there's not a seat already there, how do you build it for them? And then help them so that they can then go build a seat for the next person. And we start this ripple effect by being that change because we showed up differently. Just things to think about. Some, some tidbits. Um, so I'm going to go back to like Kendra's mom, which we did not plan this before, but I love this quote too. I've learned that people will forget what you said. They will forget what you did. But they will never forget how you made them feel. And that's why whenever I think about human interactions and when I talk about energy, it's a real thing. Start paying attention. When you leave someone with someone's interaction, do you feel better? that this was an impactful relationship or do you feel nothing or worse? Because if you don't feel better, I wouldn't go back to that again. Or I would figure out a different way that you can show up for it because there is no neutral ground when you're doing an exchange of energy. It's an ad or it, it's a deplete. And hopefully you can surround yourself and start paying attention to the people that help you thrive so that when you come together, I can tell you when I call Mari and we do a strategy session, I'm on fire for a week of energy, fireworks and it happened because she and I have an energy that works to make sure that I want her to be her best self and she wants me to be my best self. And so it's really about finding people who have that energy that can set your soul on fire because it does make a difference in how you show up and what you do. Um, all right, so it's 11, it's 11.52 here. If you have your camera on, I'm gonna ask that you shut it off. And I want you to think and you do not have to share this. And I know that we're recording this, but I want you guys to do this for me. For the next two minutes, and I'm going to time this, I want you to write, if you really knew me, you would know. And I want you to write fluidly. I want you to write about if you really knew me, like you would know that, that I grew up in the foster care system. If you really knew me, you'd know that I love my daughter more than anything on the face of this earth. It can be anything, but I want it to be authentic and true to you so that 
people so that you can look back on this and think think about how this can impact where you go next. How does your purpose in life showcase? What does this mean as you move forward? Who do you allow to see this part of you? And what would be different if people did know that this was who you really were? I'll bring you guys back in two minutes. I'm going to give you guys one more minute and then we'll come back on. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and bring you guys back. Does anyone want to share anything? And this I know can be very personal, very private. I do know that we are recording right now, but does anyone have anything that they would be willing to share? Brandon, your head nodding. I see you. <laughs> oh, but you're on mute. Probably because you're on your phone. I'm getting off mute, I'm getting off mute. I was finishing, I was finishing my, uh, my little paragraph uh, if you really knew me, you would know that I had a difficult childhood and that I was be not from a lack of su family support. It was overcoming and adapting to the disability cerebral palsy that I have. And I was lucky that I could learn how to adapt to the difficulties I faced and kind of find humor in the face in the challenges I faced. Brandon, that is beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I didn't know Brandon over the years. I did not know that. This is an exercise that I would challenge, especially if you're a leader of an organization or you're a leader of anything. This is probably one of the most beautiful things that you can do if you want to try and create some psychological safety with your team. And you as the leader should always go first. But there are some amazing things that you can learn about people if you give them the space to be able to show up as their very best authentic self. You will learn things that you would never, ever get to know about people. And it will help you relate better. It will help you lead be better. It will help people show up for you in the best ways possible, because you also are going to be there in that capacity with. Um, I do this at the National Leadership Academy with a group of college, high school, college students. And we sit in a circle and Everyone gets two minutes and we just let things flow. And I will tell you, it is like the most beautiful heart opening exercise that you can do where people really like the more honest that you get to be about sharing who you are and Brandon, that was awesome. So thank you very much. Again, not planned, but this is where people can show up as their very best versions of themselves. And we come as we are and everything that we show up with, we should be able to help each other bring that out because keeping it in isn't always the greatest thing ever. And we all have a story. Everybody has a story. So how right. you continue to do this is what's next and what's up to me. To be able to Can I go next? Yeah, Mari, please. No, I don't like this song. <laughs> but if you really knew me, this is what you would know is that I love sharing with people what I love. Tea, plants, herbs, nature. I love giving back and I have a passion for helping others and empowering women to find their dharma. And for me, I used to be very afraid of people, like, who does she think she is, you know, but I don't care anymore because I have the courage to stand up and say, this is who I am. And I've met myself and I'm going to lift myself and be herself fiercely. Like, this is me and this is who I'm going to be. And I'm not going to be afraid. 
I'm a dreamer too. I'm a huge dreamer and I won't apologize for that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's where you gotta show up your shirt. All <laughs> right, my last, I got one more. Does anyone else want to share? Yeah, th this is all I can share something real quick. Um, if, if you really knew me, um, you would know that I, you know, that, that I'm, that I'm made of my past life experiences of, of really overcoming specifically a war, moving from the other side of the world with barely nothing. And just really the journey that I went through over the last 30 years to kind of make me who I am by learning from all the encounters and people that I went through, um, and, and not to just to say this, but I learned from you a lot too, Claire, the last year and a half. And I'm not just bragging, I promise, but that's kind of really about me. Just people would know what I went through the last 30 years to kind of be where I am right now. Thank you, Ella. Thanks for sharing that too. Ah, you guys, this is where it like gets a little, whew. Um, I will say if you do do this exercise, bring Kleenexes because people will feel things. You will feel things. Yep. Some good stuff. And if you did and you didn't get to, if you started to feel things and you didn't get a full, you know, your full time to write, take, take a few moments and journal on it because I think it can really change your life. When we talk about these single pivotal moments that can change the trajectory of your life, here's one for you right now. So I hope that you guys can take that with, but, and also kind of like what Mari just said, this is my absolute favorite quote to end with because I believe that Apple wrote this for me a long time ago and I just had to find my people to help get there. But here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, but the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some people may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the world's who are crazy because the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. And so with that, I thank you for spending your last hour with me. I adore you all. I want to hear from everyone. I want to hear more about you and thank you for your time. Mari, Annalise, and Decca, Donna. Thank you, thank thank you guys. You, Claire. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Claire. Love you so much. Thank you. So thank awesome. you everyone. Thank you everybody. Thank you Bye, guys. Thank you.